Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from our risen and reigning Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. A happy Thanksgiving to you and to your family. It was the first Thanksgiving since my parents' divorce, and my dad was determined to make the dinner like normal. Now, my dad was not a, a cheap man by any means, but he did like to save money where he could. And so he thought for that first Thanksgiving that he was going to cook, he thought the great idea to save money was to get an aluminum roasting pan. I thought it was a, it was a great idea, it was cheaper, and we were only going to use it to cook the turkey. What could possibly happen? And so I was all on board with this idea. It saves us money, we don't have to worry about having to keep it, uh, find a place to store it. Sounds like a great idea. So Thanksgiving Day comes, and my dad does what everyone normally does. He gets up and he puts the turkey in the oven. And we had a tradition in my family that we would go outside and we would hang up Christmas lights on Thanksgiving Day. And so that's what we did. We were outside hanging our lights and putting up our Christmas decorations. And we finish. And now it's time to, to go inside and to finish the rest of the food that we're going to have for the meal. My dad wanted to do what a lot of people cooking a turkey do. They want to kind of look at it, make sure it's cooking, it's, it's, it's juicy and everything, it's not drying out. So he opened the oven and he begins to slide the turkey pan out of the oven. As he begins to slide it, the bottom of the pan hits the bottom of the oven, along with the turkey and the grease. You, I can still remember hearing the grease sizzling and just smoke pouring out of the oven. <laughs> And my dad, as calm and as collected as can be, he just finds a plate and, and picks the turkey, or somehow moves the turkey from the bottom of the oven onto the plate. Meanwhile, the house is filling up with smoke and the grease is still sizzling, and now the smoke detector has begun to go off. My dad does not panic. He's just as calm as can be, and he starts to go around. He opens all the doors and windows so we can begin to air out the house and get that smoke alarm to turn off. Eventually, the house begins to clear of all that smoke and all of that uh, effect of, of the turkey. We get everything cleaned up. We get the rest of the food prepared. And at this time, we went next door to our neighbor, and we asked him if we could borrow one of their roasting pans to finish the turkey. So we got the turkey finished cooking and everything, and we're sitting down to the meal. And one of the traditions that my family had was before we would eat, we would all go around and say what we were thankful for. So my older brother went first, then my dad, and then it came to me. And without skipping a beat, what I said I was grateful for that year was smoke alarms. <laughs> I got that look from my dad that I will never forget, that look of, that's not funny. <laughs> I still remember that look, but I have to add this morning that that turkey was delicious after all of that. Thanksgiving is that time of year where we as a people of God, we set aside and where we're to have an attitude of gratitude. We see an attitude of gratitude demonstrated for us this morning in our gospel reading from Luke, from the one leper who comes back to Jesus after being cleansed. Jesus, in our gospel reading, is making his way to Jerusalem. This is his, as he's making his way to the final time to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. Jesus is passing between Samaria and Galilee. If you look at a map geographically, it would have been easier and a shorter distance for Jesus to go another direction. So he's taking the long way around by going between Samaria and Galilee. And as he's making his way, he encounters these ten lepers. They're standing at a distance from Jesus, and they're calling out to him, trying to get his attention. They have to stand at a distance because they're considered unclean by Jewish laws. In the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, God told Moses in chapters 13 and 14 how they were to treat people who had leprosy, how they were to be handled. People who were found to have leprosy in the, in the Bible, they were separated from society. They were made to live outside of society because they were considered unclean by Jewish laws. The only way that these lepers could rejoin uh, society is to go to the priest and show themselves, and he was the one who could declare them clean. So Jesus is, is on the road. These men meet him. They're crying out to him, getting his attention, and Jesus tells them to go and show themselves to the priest. 
Luke doesn't tell us exactly when it happens, but as they're going along the way, they're cleansed. And only one of the ten men realizes this, and he comes back and he falls at the face of Jesus and praises him for it. Luke tells us that this this man in particular was a Samaritan. Now the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they didn't get along. It goes back to that time in the Old Testament. Back during the, the time of the kingdom of Israel, when there were the two kingdoms, there was a foreign nation called the Assyrians. The Assyrians came in and conquered the Israelites. And one of the things the Israelites did was they began to intermarry with the, uh, the Assyrians. They get, began to intermarry and mix the blood. And so the, the Jewish people who didn't intermarry, they looked down on the Samaritans who did because they weren't full-blooded Jews. And that hatred and that dislike of each other continued throughout the Old Testament. We even read about it during the time in the ministry of Jesus. We read about it in the Gospel of John when Jesus has that encounter with the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman. Jesus sees this man and he responds by telling this man to go. And in our English translation, it says that he, his, uh, he has been made well. But in the original Greek, when you look at it, the word that is used there is sozo, it, which it means to save. So when you translate it with that, it means Jesus is telling this man to go. His faith has saved him. Remember that ten men were cleansed, but only one of them returned to praise God. Why did the other nine not return to praise God? Maybe some, some hypothetical answers I could give you were maybe they were, they were so caught up in being healed, they were so full of joy that they, it didn't dawn on them to stop and thank God for what had happened to them. Maybe they were so focused on how they could rejoin society, how they could be with their families again, how they could be with everyone else in the community, no longer separated. Maybe that's why they didn't stop and praise God or go back to Jesus. Whatever the reason, they didn't come back and, and thank God for their healing. If you grow up in the Lutheran church, you know this text well, because each year we read this text. And each year we can point out how there were ten, of, ten lepers, men who had leprosy, but only one came back to Jesus. But how often do we stop in our lives and thank God for all the blessings that he has given to us in this life? And how he continues to bless us each day more than we deserve. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he encouraged us as his people to go to him when we're in trouble, when we're worried, when we're upset about something. And we are great at that as, as Christians. We love to go to the Lord. We're, we're looking at a, a medical crisis, a situation we're scared about. We're looking into the future and we don't know what to do. We're looking at something different in our life, and we are not sure what direction. We're looking for wisdom, and we always go to the Lord, and we ask him for those things. And all those things, we ask the Lord to be with us and to guide us, and God is faithful to his word. He is there for us. He guides us. He brings us to the other side. But how many times after we've gotten through whatever it may be, do we actually stop and give thanks and tell him, thank you for getting me through this, or giving me the wisdom, or providing this for me. How many times in our lives do we actually do that? How many times do we just not really think about it, and we just keep living our life, we just keep going the direction we were headed, not giving any thought or praise to God for what he's done for us? It's so easy for us as a people to forget to stop and thank God, because we live in a world that is so fast-paced. Everything is constantly moving around us, and we want to stay in tune with that. And so we sometimes will for stop, we'll forget to stop and give thanks to God. Martin Luther, in his uh, explanation in the small catechism in, to the uh, second commandment, that's the commandment that has to do with how we are to use the name of the Lord. Luther tells us we're not to misuse the name of the Lord. But then in the explanation, he tells us that we are to call upon it in every trouble, prayer, and praise, and to give thanks. As I said before, we're very good at the first part of that. 
always calling upon the Lord when we're in trouble. We're always quick to call on him when we need something. But the Lord doesn't just want to hear from us when we're in trouble, when we want something, when, we're, when we need something. He loves to hear from us as his creatures with words of thanksgiving and praise for whatever it may be. And we have many things to be thankful for. Most importantly, how God sent his one and only son, Jesus, into our flesh to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, to take the punishment that you and I rightly deserved. And because of his death on the cross, we have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life with him. We have many things to be thankful for during this time of Thanksgiving. It should make us have an attitude of gratitude. But how do we live with an attitude of gratitude? How do we reflect this to our world that seems just so fast-paced? How do we reflect it? It's very, it seems very simple, but we just we live with an attitude of gratitude by stopping to give thanks to the Lord for all that He gives to us each day and for all that He continues to give to us. When we go through something challenging in our lives, whether it's medical, financial, family, whatever it may be, when we get through and it's, it's resolved, we, we stop what we're doing and we truly thank God for getting us through it, for being with us, for giving us the strength to go through it. Another way to have an attitude of gratitude is either in the morning or in the evening before you go to bed, just before you close your eyes, Say, thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. Thank you for my children, my husband, my wife, my dog, whatever it may be, whatever kind of blessing that God has given to you. That's how you begin to have an attitude of gratitude. One of the ways that we can and demonstrate this attitude of gratitude is one of the traditions I shared with you at the beginning of my story. When you gather with your friends and family or if you gather downstairs for the meal, before you, you carve the turkey, before you eat the mashed potatoes, go around the table and say what you're thankful for. We have so much to be thankful for, even much more than smoke alarms, as I said. We're not only to have this attitude of gratitude, only at this time of Thanksgiving, where we set aside time as a nation to thank God, but we're to have it year around, every day, because of all the blessings that God has given to us. As I close this morning, there's a, there's a hymn that we're going to sing at the close of our service. It's called, uh, thank, Now Thank We All Our God. And I want you, as we, we're going to sing this later, but as I, I read these words, I want you to hear how this reflects an attitude of gratitude to Jesus. The hymn goes, Now thank we all our God, with hearts and hands and voices, whose wondrous things has done, in whom his world rejoices who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. In Jesus' name, amen.